Franklin County Commissioners Meeting, April 21st, 2020. Franklin County Commissioners Meeting, April 21st, 2020. Is 9 a.m. for and we're here for a regular Tuesday morning uh, board meeting. Um, we have a full complement of commissioners this morning on site. Uh, Mr. Johnson, our administrator, and Karen, our clerk. And if you uh, would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Thank you. Um, our first item on the agenda is there is an opening, our first opportunity for public comment. Uh, also, uh, there's a phone number that's available to call in, and we'll do our best to uh, answer them as they come in so you aren't on queue longer than you need be. So, public comment? Morning. Joel Prantle, from right here in Franklin County. Um, hopefully uh, we can get this open back up to the county for people to go to work. Um, if we can work on maybe something like that, because I got workers that are suffering. They need to get back to work. We got ones that lots of them that never, ever got any, any unemployment. And we have a lot of businesses that are out that can't even draw unemployment and they can't, they don't fit the criteria that they can get any funds from the government anyway. So every one of them businesses are suffering and they're going to close and they'll never reopen. So we really, really need to get them back to work and I'd say as soon as possible. Thanks, John. Further public comment? Okay, with that we'll move on to approval Mr. of minutes. Mr. Chairman, before we move on, uh, Yes. We have a policy that we don't Q&A for the public comments, but now the comments are closed. I would like to make a comment uh, on that topic. Um, we received, like the rest of you, a number of emails from people asking the commissioners to reopen the county. And uh, if anyone knows of a statute or authority for this board to overrule the governor's executive order, please show it to me because yeah. I would love to use it. I'd love to reopen the county. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we just simply don't have the authority. With respect to authority, if you look at RCW 4643-06220, and if you'll permit me, it's short, but I'll read it. This is the authority that limits the governor's authority to create and extend an executive order like the one he's used to shut down our county. This is uh, subparagraph four. No order or orders concerning waiver of suspension of statutory obligations or limitations under subsection two of this section may continue for longer than 30 days unless extended by the legislature through concurrent resolution. That hasn't happened. If the legislature is not in session, the waiver or suspension of statutory obligations or limitations may be extended in writing by the leadership of the Senate and the House of Representatives until the legislature can extend the waiver or suspension by concurrent resolution. To my knowledge, that hasn't happened either. So by my reading, this is day 90. The governor's authority ended at day 30. As far as I'm concerned, the county is open, and I'd encourage people within the law and within the parameters of their own safety, we're adults, we can make these decisions, to behave accordingly. That's what I'm doing. Thanks. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd like to make a motion. And I'd like this on the record, please. I move that Franklin County, in recognition of the governor's stay-at-home emergency proclamation that is now deemed unconstitutional, we support the reopening for all builders and small businesses that want to work. 
Second. Okay. Further discussion? I would just add that um, something like this probably benefits from a legal review, and I'd like to know whether or not the motion has seen some legal review. To, to my knowledge, there's, there's nothing uh, unlawful or inappropriate about it. I'm just looking to see if we've run it by our staff. Nobody, to my knowledge, is... Keith, are you familiar with it at all? No, it's the first time I've heard of it. Yeah. So my uh, my second was and is contingent on my belief that it's a lawful motion, and therefore I can still support it. Yeah. 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 I'm going to have a hard time supporting it without knowing for sure that uh, that it is legal. Um, um, well, I'm I'm I just read verbatim from yeah. the statute, mm -hmm. and uh, I did a reasonable amount of legwork to find out whether or not the leaders of the House and the Senate uh, have signed in writing to extend it, and I can't find that. Okay. Uh, my sources are not aware of it happening. Uh, I know that Representative Clipper from the 8th Legislative District has publicly, repeatedly, verbally and in writing, called for the legislature to take up this matter, and so far they have not. So... Um, you know, we, we all stand up and take an oath to defend both the state and federal constitutions. And when we, we you know, get to take the oath coming into each term, we support and defend the constitution of, of the state. And um, you know, I'm, I'm not able to find anything anywhere that says that we're prohibited from reopening. The difficulty, of course, is that uh, businesses that reopen – uh, may find it difficult to work with businesses in other counties that aren't reopening, but that should not stop us. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, we're uh, we're adults. I think uh, we understand what social distancing means and what the perceived benefits of it are. Um, and we can be responsible for the younger folks in our own families. So, again, barring any evidence from anybody that says that um, – you know, we can't do this. I, I think we need to step up there and, and just say it's time. Yeah. I know that Senator Schessler has been doing the same thing as you speak of as, as Brad Clipper is doing. So, And, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, article out there today that uh, reopened Seattle Park's farmer's market give hint of normalcy amid shutdown. So we have King County opening up parks and farmer's markets. So I think we've got a motion and a second. I think we should vote it and vote it in. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So be it. Thank you. Uh, all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I didn't catch your vote. Was that a I nay? Said aye. Oh, okay, thank you. Apologies, my hearing's not perfect today. So with that, uh, we will carry on to the approval of minutes for April 7th. Uh, if there's no additions, corrections, or... Uh, changes. I'll sign them as presented. No change. No changes. Okay. Uh, that'll move us on to um, emergency extension. Keith, please. Yes. Uh, we recognized uh, at the outset of this uh, restriction on uh, employees coming to work and uh, lack of personal protection equipment that we were experiencing at the time, some of those kinds of things that we kind of did this in steps, um, not knowing how long it was supposed to last. Uh, so we have already extended our emergency provision one time, and this is a, a request to extend it, to line it with the, the governor's order of ending on May 4th or whenever the governor lifts his travel and other bans. Um, in light of the motion that was just passed, I don't think it's – necessarily conflicting with that. Um, I think we can work through the intent of the board on what your uh, stated uh, path forward is, but this still allows us to use uh, the federal leave bank that was recently passed by Congress and signed by the President um, and to, to manage the, the HR side of, of things and uh, align Franklin County's uh, emergency order that allows us to uh, 
procure goods and services uh, without going through a protracted uh, bidding process. Uh, so I, I still recommend that we adopt the, the resolution that's before you. I, I agree. There is a, uh, a resolution 2020-104. Oh, yeah. I didn't see you put it there. Okay, well, I would imagine there's no additional explanation required following Mr. Johnson, so I will simply move for uh, approval of the resolution as described. And I'm sorry, did you say that was 2020-074? 104. Okay. All right. One zero four. Move for approval. Is there a second? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm reluctant on a second because uh, fourth line down. Whereas on April second, two twenty twenty, Governor Inslee extended the statewide stay-at-home order until May fourth of twenty twenty. We're not going to recognize that, and we've got this in this. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're conflicting with the motion we passed to what, how this is written. I say we strike that line because we're not recognizing that anymore, and we need to read through this and strike the lines on the state of whole orders because we're not – we've already passed that we want Franklin County to open back up for business. So I don't want to conflict ourselves with this emergency declaration. Yeah. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, in a resolution like this, the whereas is are – simply statements of fact and condition. They don't necessarily have to buttress or support the action that's being taken. It's just an awareness that whereas this has happened. Um, so I, while I, I get your point and I, I would not disagree that there's an apparent disconnect, but really uh, the whereas is, is informational only. So I don't, right. I don't see it as a problem. Okay. Yeah. So as, as it, it explained to me then, mm -hmm. we're going to recognize our previous motion. Correct. That, that Franklin County is back up for business. Okay. Yeah. I second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, that will bring us to uh, paying the bills. Please. Mr. Chairman, we have two uh, fiscal notes this morning. The first is fund expenditures that move for approval in the amount of $446,324.99. These are for fund expenditures. And I would note that this has been reviewed by the county administrator and two members of the auditor's office. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And next and final is salary clearing payroll, emergency management payroll. Move for approval in the amount of $991,327.67. And note that this has been reviewed by two members of the county auditor's office. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. With that, that brings us down to our uh, approval of the consent agenda, one through eight. So, Mr. Chairman, eight items in the consent this morning. Uh, I suspect there may be some discussion or perhaps desire to separate items for separate consideration. Um, if there are any, okay, not hearing any, then I'll go ahead and move for approval of uh, consent. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I was preoccupied there. Yes, I, I would like to pull items one and two for discussion and separate vote, please. Okay, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, disregard the start of the former motion. Move for approval of consent agenda items three through eight and hold items one and two for separate independent discussion. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Discussion? Okay, so we've got a letter here that was sent to me by uh, Mr. Mahoney and Mr. Mahoney, if you wouldn't mind your email that you sent. Uh, 2017 until today, Franklin County occurred costs of repairs to the Eltopia Railroad Crossing in the amount of $3,176.89. In accordance with this agreement between Franklin County and Ben, uh, our, uh, Burlington North Santa Fe Freight, our costs represent 75% of the totals of repairs based on the data. We estimate 10 years of repairs to be 10590 Now, you go on in the proposed width of El Topia West Road at the railroad crossing. Right now, from the guardrail to the center line, we have 23.92 feet 
on each side of the road, correct? A total of 47.84. Is that correct? Um, that is actually measured from the center line. The 23.92 to the is from the center line to the edge of pavement. From the center line to the guardrail, the face of guardrail is, is the 29.67 number. And I don't see that number on this page. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I guess it was over there. <clears throat> so actually it's almost 30 feet. That's correct. Well, that's excellent because if we're to narrow this down to 34 feet total width from well, – Correct. Uh, what, what, would be the, what would be the total width from the center line to the guardrail once we narrow it up? What I put down below is that that would uh, come out to be 19 feet. Yeah. We would effectively be removing one lane, going from a four-lane facility down to a two-lane facility, which then would allow them to shorten the, uh, the arms. Yeah. And I guess that in where it, it bothers me is because, and I read through the RCWs, the uh, permitting process, and there's only two farmers out there right now that have got these permits. So the, obviously there's a lot of illegal activity going on out there. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't go far. You know, I'm not going to say that. Well, well, sometimes it takes education to let people know. but Exactly. But my understanding about farm implements is farm implements, according to the statutes and the WACs, cannot go down any any road in the state of Washington Beyond 14 feet, according no, to the RCW. Well, no, less than they can go down if they're 20 feet or less, less than 20 feet. Yeah, but feet. they have to have flight cars. Well, even if you look at the RCW, they're exempt from the previous RCWs, which talk specifically about the width, which is 8'6". No vehicle is allowed to be wider than 8'6", 8 right, feet 6 right, inches. Right, right. It, it, that RCW exempts 14-foot wide Farm implements right. going down the road if they are patrolled, flagged, yeah. lighted. So even when we're talking about from a permitting standpoint, the next one would be 16 feet. 16 feet aren't required to have a permit, either a state permit or a county permit. And the definition for farm implement is defined in the WAC mm -hmm. that I provided. I got it. That 16 feet still requires them to be flagged, lighted, patrolled, all of those things, and then 20 feet. So the two that we do have that were for 365 days a full year that won't be come up until September of this year, one thing about them is they're at 19 feet 11 inches. And in talking with, with individuals that are more experts in this than I am, that's how farm implements are designed. They're designed to meet our criteria. So if anything is going down our road that's wider than 20 feet, mm -hmm. they're not breaking it down as far as they could to get it to get, and they're not getting permits. We're not seeing the permits. A majority of the permits that we give out for loads are with the irrigation district, South Columbia Basin Irrigation District, and, and usually contractors. We're finding that we don't see a lot of permits other than from the same couple farmers. They get permits every year from us. And I think that's just education. I think we've got to get the people informed. And can you tell me what that permit is running for per implement to go up and down the road, what the cost is? I believe you can get an annual permit for 25. I think it's less than 25. I can't remember that, off the top of my head, but I can certainly get that to the board. Does that cover the whole farm, or does that cover just one implement? It usually covers an implement. but Just one? But, yeah. So if you had many. If you have many, you need to you get them all because you have to provide them to the law enforcement official, and it has to be on the vehicle. So South Columbia Basin Irrigation District, they got many great alls. They got mm -hmm. many trucks, mm -hmm. that, especially the great alls. Mm -hmm. those, have, those extend beyond the front of the vehicle too far, okay. and that's why they have them. They get them for each each one of their vehicles that could be traveling down a county road. So my concern on this was the fact that they've got these 20-foot, I don't have one, I don't have the, the horsepower to pull a 20-foot seed bed maker, which is actually two big, massive, heavy packers front and back yeah. with tillage teeth in the middle. I mean, if you hit this, this isn't going to move, the car's going to move. Yeah, and that's, I think that's why they, they don't allow anything over 20 feet is there is a there is an extreme right. safety concern with 
with that. And, and that's, I guess that's my concern is if we narrow this up and the cost, yeah, it, it's 3000 but we're going to spend uh, what, 80000 90000 to you know what, narrow it. Commissioner, this whole, what I'm concerned with, this whole in discussion is mute. That is Squatso Bridge just within exactly. 100 feet of it. Mm -hmm. I just measured this morning. It's mm -hmm. a 12-foot lane with a 4-foot Exactly. Guardrail. So that's what I was just going to bring up because we've got yeah. that bottleneck. So what's the problem with <laughs> passing these two? Because if we got that bottleneck right there, and then we create a more of a, we've created a longer distance with a bigger bottleneck with a 20 foot seed bed maker that cars got to maneuver around when it's going to be across in their lane. And when I did the math, if you stay two foot away so you don't hit the guardrail and you don't hit that, you've created a longer distance. Yeah for cars to maneuver around this equipment, and it, that's where I'm finding the hazard. Well, the, but when we're talking about bridges in Franklin County, we're talking about these areas where we, because we have guardrail regardless of whether it's at railroad tracks or whether it's out in the county to protect people from other hazards, which do, um, do in some people say constrict. It actually doesn't constrict. This, this is re by, based on my reading of the lag manual, the local agency guidelines, this road, as a minimum right now, would require a 30 foot, a 34 foot total width. Typically, that's 11 foot lanes with the six foot shoulders. We typically go ahead and stripe 12 foot lanes with the five foot shoulders. So, a 34 foot wide. We have sections of Eltopia that do have guardrail on them maybe just on one side, and then that's when you put in that additional two-foot buffer. I'm not trying to argue. I'm just trying to provide information. The reason that we're here today for this project is the Burlington Northern Santa Fe approached us. They had a problem. We, we understood the problem. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a designer of their facilities. I'm sure they have some of the top engineers that work on the mechanisms for those, I know that they're, they have a lot of fail safes in them. But what I do know is I would hate for a gate to be broken in the wind when a, and then it'd be ineffective if a train is coming through there and somebody actually is in that intersection. And that's the concern I have as the public works director for Franklin County is making sure that the people of Franklin County are protected. The easy fix for us now, we didn't take it lightly. I mean, when they came in and said narrow the road, the other option is they can put another another two arms in the middle of the road. They do that, it effectively does the same thing. And we see that a lot of places where you'll have the arms that come down and then you'll have arms in the very center of the road. You have to create an island. That, to me, restricts the road even oh, yes. more because, and we didn't want to do that because we understand the nature of our county. We didn't want to have to do that, but that would have been the other option. So we went with what we considered to be the most unobtrusive option and still providing what the railroad needed and providing what that road facility needed. The rest of the road is 34 foot wide with guardrail in places. The bridges are, are restriction points. And when we come up to restriction points, it's not about vehicles going around. When you have a load that is wider than what is required whether it is needs to be permitted or you can it's exempt from getting a permit but still requires flagging those are areas that you're supposed to stop and flag and get out and actually flag vehicles through at bridges at these pinch points so that there aren't these conflicts between does that happen all the time? It, I see where it's difficult for our farmers to do that because they're going from field to field, and I understand that. But that's the intent of the statutes in the wax is for when those situations do occur because they occur on state highways as well. Um, I'm glad you mentioned state highways, Mr. Mahoney. Um, given the location of that gate, it would seem that Traffic crossing those railroad tracks there is either just cross 395 or is coming off of 395 or vice versa. But where is the predominant traffic 
headed going through that railroad crossing. And the reason I ask is because I, I, I would imagine that our farmers are sensitive to the law, and I guess I'm having trouble imagining that they would knowingly take machinery down 395 in violation of the law for size restraints. I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? The the farm equipment that we would see, the trucking that we would see, certainly is going to 395 coming off. As far as farm implements, right? They yeah, they would have to have a a very. We follow the same permit process that the DOT does, so it would be absolutely the same permit, and the DOT wash dot. Um, and they're not just crossing 395; they're actually transiting. They would portions, be transiting. I see them transit, transiting sure. on 395. I see them on I-182. Right. Exactly. And they don't do that without flaggers, do they? No. Or without pilot cars? They have pilot cars. They're flagged up. They're lit up. Yes. So, I guess explain to me what do they? They just lose the pilot cars and the flaggers when they make the turn onto Eltopia? No. In that in that case, I believe the. I would have to believe the answer is no. Where I think we see the issues is with crossing is traffic. really the farmers that are moving from field to field okay. to field within within the county without actually entering state highways. Is most of that traffic going through there with implements? Uh, you think coming off of 395 or crossing 395? Some could be crossing, but I think it's either coming on three off the 395 or back onto 395 to get to other counties. We know we so, have custom so it cutters. So sounds, sounds like you said, and don't let me put words in your mouth, okay. correct me if I get this wrong, but what I thought I heard you say was the majority, if not the vast majority, are coming down 395, and it, it's a much smaller portion that's actually crossing 395 there. Can you, can you calibrate yes. that? Yes. I would yes. say yes. Okay. And on 395, I'd like to just... And I got a couple questions, Matt. On 395, you got to understand that you, the, it's a highway. You got two lanes north, two lanes south, big shoulders. So equipment we can get off onto the shoulders and be so much safer, given plenty of room for people to go out. But you get on the narrow county roads, and, and as we've seen with the yes. reflectors, there's casualties everywhere out there on those reflectors. Yeah. But here's the thing I want to ask you: Eltopia is growing. Uh, Heinz just put in for another pl plot of houses. Houses are being, we're getting more and more people coming down and crossing there. I, it's just safety for me too, Matt. Yeah, I know. But the other thing is, are we still going to have the bus able to turn, get off the road to stop like they do when the, and the cars to go by when the bus stops to open the doors and listen, and then they can pull back on because that's there mm -hmm. now. Are we still going to have that there, for there, the buses? There will still be some room for that. You're talking about a 19-foot width and a normal vehicle needs Less than you know leads eight feet. Yeah, they shouldn't. So there be is room the for that. No matter what. But we work with the buses, with the with both North Franklin and Pasco School District, and we're fully aware of their routes on any given year, and they yeah. do change every given year. You know, not not to say that's not a bus route, but it is. But. And they pull off to yeah. listen for the train. That's their rules. They have yeah. to do it. And then cars can and migrate it, around them and until comes, they take off again. Yeah, and it comes to down to whether or not we've seen the backups of traffic in that situation. And we're just not seeing that from a traffic. And I understand more vehicles are going to be there. Yeah. But, you know, you're typically talking about usually the matter of a couple seconds for them to stop <laughs> open. And so we're not seeing – like you may see in some areas where you've got tens of thousands of vehicles um, that are traveling through a corridor where somebody stopping like that can can completely back up traffic for a mile this may this may impact a you know a few vehicles at a time when that does happen so yeah we've we've thought about that and that's what this design was really initially for was because it's the only area of the of that road that's a four lane design, and so the intent of it and the way that it was originally designed with the tapers was for a pull out and stop, and not just for school buses. The same goes for truck, you know, hauling chemicals, specific chemicals. They have to do the stop too, just like pro, you know, propane companies. Yep. They have to stop at them as well, and so that was the original intent. And yes, we're seeing some residential rural residential growth in that area, 
Um, but we, we, I think we'll be many years down the road before we see any and you're telling major me impact. And Matt, let me slip a question in here. Um, if I'm understanding you, and again, if I get this wrong, correct me, because we, we need to deal with facts. If the project as proposed were completed, would the crossing still accommodate the maximum legal width vehicle implement under state law? Yes. So for me, that's pretty definitive. I think really the focus for me is what is the uh, impact of users crossing that um, because if it will accommodate a legal width, then any impact on that presumably is, is largely for vehicles that are not in compliance with the statute for width. Is that what I'm hearing? That would be true, yes. Yes. Okay. It, and, the, it, it, and let's not pretend that there's not larger when they're moving houses and stuff. There are much bigger loads that go down sure. states of the highway, but through a permit process, you guide them through. Like we would not guide somebody that was moving a house on gravel roads that are 24 feet wide. We would put them on roads that are wide enough. We would steer them clear of bridges. And we would enforce, you know, enforce a route for them not to go across these these types of pinch points. The other thing I want to add is the widths well, that we're that, talking that about. Be, be, okay. I'll just follow up on my earlier okay. question. So if you've got like a, oh, for potatoes, like a, a six-row cedar or something that is pretty wide and not easy to break down, you know, they come from the manufacturer smaller, but once they get all assembled, it's not like you pull off the road and, take out your pocket knife and disassemble it, it's, it's quite a task. What about that? Does that? Would it prevent them from getting through, or does it just require extra manpower for flagging and pilot cars? I, I don't know what the total width of, of some of the implements are not broke down, but what I do know is, according to the statutes and the WACs, they're required to break them down as far as they can. In my understanding with farm implements, they're being designed and built to meet this 20-foot requirement. So 19 foot 11 inches is the is what I've been seeing, and that's as far as they can break them down. So they course, can be that, broken that's down. That's probably the ones made today, ones that are 15, 20 years old, maybe not so much. Um, I think that the, like I spoke before, I think, in, and I can go back in the history of the RCWs and the wax, but I think that the sizes have actually gotten bigger. When I was first talking, 16 foot was my memory, and then at the last meeting, and I went back and looked, and now it's 20 foot, and they have an exemption for 16 foot. That, so it, the equipment has gotten bigger, but there's a limit to what can be allowed. Like I said, even on state highways, because there's state highways that aren't that are the same width as our county, some of our county roads. When we got county roads that are 40 feet width. You're talking about SR-17, and we got guardrail, and we have all of that. This is going to be a 38-foot width from face of rail to face of rail. We're, this is going to be pretty comparable to an SR-17, which carries tens of thousands of vehicles. And our highest traveled road, which is Taylor Flats, is less than 10,000 a day. So... We know that we know that it will work, but I I truly understand. I don't really have a dog in the fight other than a a problem was brought forth. I brought it. We brought it to the board. It got on our six year tip, and it's a safety issue. The railroad brought it to us. I the the three thousand dollars that we paid in the last three over three thousand that we paid in the last three years, which by the way. Going back to 2017 and our rec records with um, BNSF in one solution, the num dollar amount I gave you was all that intersection. We have other intersections with BNSF where we're required to pay a portion of the cost, and, and we had no other invoices. This intersection is a trouble intersection for them, and it becomes troubling for me. Matt, excuse me, Matt. Because of the safety. Yeah, that's... So BNSF is asking to have this done. Presumably it's not for cost of 
crossing arms because we cover most, if not all of that. Yeah. So it can't be a financial matter for them. They must see liability in it if uh, an arm blows off and and it's supposed to have come down, but there's no visible arm because it's laying in the ditch when it blew off in the storm. Correct. Somebody crosses, gets hit by a train, even though BNSF is going to come back and lay it on our feet for liability because they asked us to do this and theoretically, let's say we decline. Um, that would presumably transfer some of the liability from BNSF to the county, too, or at least that, that's, that's my view. I mean, if they've come to us and said this is an issue and we don't take action, then I think there's potential for some transfer of some of that liability. Yeah. BNSF's still going to get sued. County's still yeah. going to get sued. We know how yeah. that works. Certainly, that was the that was the impetus of them coming to us, was they, they perceived that as being a major liability for, for that set, for that track. Yes, absolutely. When they're being called out at all hours to go out to, you know, we don't know what we don't know. They don't know what they don't know. So usually it has to be reported. And by that time, there could have been a catastrophe. And so that's what they don't want. And you're telling us that uh, if, if this doesn't go through, then they're going to put a island in the middle of the road? That's the other option. No, we don't want that. I'd yeah, that's why that's why that. we went with this route because yeah. we believe we can meet all of our requirements for road width. I wish you would have told us that in the first meeting because yeah. that would even juggernaut out that thing even worse. You know, I have to apologize about last meeting. I ran. I, I left I the office late. I ran in here. I was out of breath. And what concerns yes. me more than the six row potato planters is the six row potato diggers. Now you're yeah. talking about an arm hanging up. I yeah. mean, these things. I don't know how these meet the requirements. I really don't of, of the DOT. I just, they're big. I oh, just Luanda knows they're they're huge. They're wide. I think they're longer than twenty. I think they're like. Yeah. I have to get into the field when they come. Yeah. I don't. I I do not want to, you know, try to guess why. But what I do know is that this equipment is designed to break down. So that it's under the 20 foot requirement, because the because the requirement is less than 20 feet. It's not 20 feet or less. It's less than 20 feet, and the permits that we do for the two farmers, especially that I listed, their equipment breaks down to 19 feet 11 inches. So Matt, and so it's designed to break down that far. I've, uh, I've yeah, I'm with you now. Yeah. With yeah. the island is completely out of the question. Yeah, and Mr. Chairman, recognizing that uh, it appears that the alternative course is is an island, and I agree that's that's a non-starter. Um, I would move for approval of resolution 2020-093 as presented. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Matt, for the Matt, explanation. Yeah, right. Also the second one, 95. Yeah. No. Mr. Chairman, move for approval of resolution 2020-095 as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, Matt, for the legwork. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, we do have one caller on the line okay. waiting, so whenever you're... <coughs> takes a few seconds to get through. Just the right time, because that brings us to public comment anyway. So with our motion, next meeting will be open for the public with chairs. Are we going to still have the social distancing going on, or we will? Probably we'll still do the social distancing requirement. This, yeah. I think that's smart, but we will put the county back up. Good morning, Mr. Smiley. Yes, sir. This is Keith Johnson, the county administrator. You are now, you have the floor with the Board of Commissioners. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I've been a uh, resident here in Franklin County for about 42 years, and I am an active farmer. And uh, the ag industry is actually moving along pretty good. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, some, some heartaches out there, especially the potato industry, because of what's been going on. I know they've been hit pretty hard. Um, but my concern is that, from what I'm noticing, um, you know, people, people from what I see, they're just fed <laughs> up with this, these restrictions. And I would like, what I guess the reason I'm calling is I, 
I've been trying to figure out how to get a message to Inslee, and I think perhaps one way, perhaps a good way, would be for the commissioners to make some kind of a statement, some kind of a stand, uh, to stand up and say, hey, we are not Seattle. This is a different part of the state. We don't have the cases, nor even Franklin County. I think we have three deaths. Uh, we just don't have the problem that other areas have. So I, I think a broad brush that uh, Governor Inslee paints the whole state is, is it just doesn't represent, represent us at all. And uh, so I'm thinking what's going to start happening is you're going to have, we are going to have more protests in this county. People are just getting fed, fed up. So, I mean, some of the things I'm, I'm hoping you would agree, some of these uh, restrictions just do not make sense. Uh, we are adults. We are able to make our own decisions. We know that if somebody has the flu, I'm just using that as an example, or a cold, we stay home, we stay away from them, we give them space till they heal up. I think we should be able to treat this virus the same exact way. Uh, I don't think this virus is going to be gone in six weeks or eight weeks or two months. I think it's something that we're going to have to ultimately learn to deal with. And so I think it's time that I personally, uh, I think we need to open up. I think we need to open up all of Franklin County. Uh, I know construction for sure would be a great thing to do. People can stay their distance. Fishing is ridiculous. They should be able to fish people who like to. Golf courses should be able to open for people who like that sport. Camping for sure should be able to be open. And then there's many un other industries that if people use their head and come some common sense and some respect for other people's space, I think we should be able to reopen. Personally, that's how I feel. I, If I could talk to Inslee in person, I would say the same exact things. I'm sure he wouldn't agree with me, but I would say the same exact things. And I think, think people just need to stand up to, to uh, our rights as citizens. I'm really glad that our sheriff, Jim Raymond, uh, is standing up for the rights of uh, the people here in Franklin County. He's made some... He's made some pretty good statements that I appreciate very much. I heard a federal judge yesterday say that really that uh, telling people that they cannot assemble together is against our constitutional rights. And uh, I, I would personally be all for our churches to, to be open. Uh, that's up to the individual churches, obviously. But I think they should be open as well. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. I hope you commissioners can put something together and be a unanimous voice, at least two of you out of the three, if you can't all agree, and get something written up or a face-to-face -face with Governor Inslee. I think the people of this county would just would love that very much. That's kind of all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, just a brief response. Uh, this is not – we don't typically engage in Q&A or debate, but uh, in this morning's meeting there was a unanimous uh, decision to open up Franklin County. And uh, last week, we sent a letter to the governor to that effect, uh, recognizing that Franklin County is not like the West Side counties, and we uh, have made that uh, well known to the governor. So I appreciate your comments. You're very welcome. I'm glad the commissioners did that. Thank, Thank you. you. No other callers on the, the line okay. this time. It is still uh, in the realm of public comment. My name is LaWanda Hatch. I um, sent you all an email. I'm not sure if you read it. But I appreciate that you are um, voting to open up Franklin County. I think we can do it responsibly. You know, I have a face mask. If I feel like I've got a cough or an itch, I can wear that um, out in public. I think that um, in speaking with a lot of small business owners throughout the Tri-Cities in both counties, I can tell you everybody is ready to get back and going, and they will do it responsibly. Um, I think that they would want that because we know if all of a sudden we start to get an outbreak, then it would cause a lot more problems than what we had. So I, I just think that if we think creatively and we think forwardly, then we can, or that you can as commissioners, set up policies for businesses to open responsibly. And I know that they would be more than happy to comply. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
I have to apologize first off for not giving Keith a heads up on what I'm going to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. I don't typically do that, but uh, this is something that came up as we're kind of going through our finances for for the public works funds that uh, we manage on behalf of the board. Some of the numbers that we've gotten and I talked about last week are pretty dire when we talk about gas tax revenue, which also affects CAP, which is our county arterial preservation program. It affects RAP, the multimodal monies that we get that are that are through that through the motor vehicle fuel tax, they're talking anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. <clears throat> so we're sitting down now, um, the county engineer Craig Erdman and myself, and we're trying to work through these numbers to project where we're going to be, how how we're going to be able to manage what it is we're doing. With that said, we are going to have to cut out completely chip seal this year. Um, we still will be able to do chip seal for some of the cities who've asked us, which um, is actually somewhat of a good thing and a bad thing. It's good news and bad news. We're being paid by another county to do work on their behalf. The bad news is that our crews are, are working for another county or another city, and they're not fully invested in the work that we're doing. But we are going to have to cut out chip seal. Another area that we're going to have to cut out is our applications of magnesium chloride. Um, that being said. Can I just interject? Yep. I've had a, a phone call from a gentleman living on Dayton Road, and mm -hmm. they want that put down on their road. They love it, and other people don't. So I, I, I know that you said you just have to cut it out. I appreciate that. I just want to know I had a positive feedback yeah. on that. Yeah, and they may, and that may, they may be part of, and I'd have to verify Dayton, but I believe Dayton is maybe a permit, and that's the next thing I wanted to yeah, talk and to. And historically, about. they've helped fund it. Various yes. various farms on Dayton have helped fund the magnet yes. chloride. Yes. Yeah, they 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 get a permit. The county does have a policy for them to get a permit. They pay for the application, but the reason I'm just want to discuss that with the board is I I want to get the board's consensus on direction for us. Because there is a county cost, of course, to even these permits. We go out, our crews, um, we prep the roads for the magnesium chloride um, application. And, uh, and of course, the landowners themselves, the permittees, pay for the actual product itself. But there is a cost. And so I would just like to get direction from the board knowing that, that we're cutting out, and, and our hope is, and just because we're cutting it out doesn't mean we still aren't going to get some benefit from the previous applications of mag chloride. The whole idea of putting down mag chloride is you put it down for a certain amount of time, and then you get enough residual that it will last and you don't have to do it every year. So we Excuse me, Matt. How yeah. much of the process is product and how much is labor It's, it's percentage? A, it's about 60-40. And 60 is? 60 is the is the permittees, the cost of the magnesium chloride. So 60% product, 40% labor. 40% labor on our part. Labor and equipment, correct. Okay. So it's not just the people who are contributing for the mag chloride materials to benefit. It's everybody in the county that uses it. So it seems to me that when uh, local folks are willing to share that cost, that that's a uh, high-value proposition for the county. It's very efficient. We get maximum use out of our dollars. Right. So. I think it's great that they're doing that, and I think we should find the funds to do it, even though you're talking about cutting out all mag chloride. And, and I'm, that's what I was looking for is just direction from the board and and also to get input from the board if, because like I said, we're just with the numbers we're seeing, we have to we have to prepare ourselves for the long haul because if we get to the point where we can't afford any materials, I want to be able to afford materials when we need to maintain the roads from a safety standpoint. Like, yeah, like, yeah. So, but, but we're going to have limited resources. We ought to get maximum mileage, and when right. there's a cost share, that's good. And I think we all know that if you don't continue to maintain these roads, they degrade, and so we'll end up paying for it next year and a year after if yeah. we don't keep after it. Yes. Great. So I, I believe I got my answer, and that's what I was looking for. Okay. As the board knows, I don't have the authority to turn down permit permittees, <laughs> permits, the board does. So I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thanks, man. Any other comments? Warren Peter. Peter Mackender from the Franklin County Assessor. Um, it, the Assessor's Office has not been closed during this event. We've been open, um, and the office is functioning, I think, quite well like electronically. Um, however, uh, volume is decreasing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with the real estate transactions uh, being impacted by the governor's proclamation. So um, I'm not saying that that has impacted values at this point. I'm just saying that transactions have lessened, um, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. um, one, one area of a concern I have is that the governor has uh, defined – certain uh, sectors of the economy as essential. One of those areas impacts my office is appraisal. And the way that's been addressed as essential in the, my reading of the governor's uh, clarification is anything supporting the mortgage or real estate transaction industry. Well, that's not what my appraisers do. So that's an area of concern that um, I, I, I wish I had more clarity on. Um, because, uh, as I've indicated before, uh, this is a point in the year where um, my appraisal staff is very much out in the field looking at new buildings, new improvements to add new construction, new value to the roles. Um, so that, that gives me, uh, there's a little conflict there uh, that exposes the county to some, some potential liability, in my opinion. So I'm trying to be careful there while I get the job done at the same time. So um, I'm working with uh, uh, human resources and risk management to hopefully have a, a safe path forward to be able to do that because we need to be able to get that done um, in an efficient and timely manner this year so we can move forward with the budget process for all the districts in the fall. Um, The other thing is, too, in light of that um, that topic, further extension by the governor will just exacerbate that situation. Um, I agree with everyone that we need to get back to work in a safe manner, and I think we can do that. Um, we've been able to do it down in my office, and uh, uh, but I am concerned with public and employee safety and how we do that in the best manner for all involved. So, and I agree with LaWanda's comments that the last thing we want to do is have this all start back up and lose the, lose the ground we've gained by um, self-isolating and, and trying to protect one another. So, um, any feedback you would have, I would greatly appreciate. And uh, if you have any concerns, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else on the line? Not at this time. Okay. I think you're up then. Keith. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I would uh, add is consistent with what Matt and Peter have already alluded to, um, just speaking generally about the county's financial condition. Uh, right now uh, we're okay, but just because of timing, we usually don't see the impact of this for a couple of months. And clearly there's going to be an impact. Um, the longer uh, stay home orders are affected across the state, then the more impact that that has. Certainly, um, sales taxes is probably the, the key area we're going to see this uh, hitting uh, the county within the next month. Uh, I would point out that the, the Happel Center is uh, operational only based on its ability to generate revenue, which has been shut down. And so we have a staff out there that um, essentially uh, to keep them on, the county would have to supplement their, their budget. Um, that's a, a decision that's probably going to be, need to be made sometime in the month of May. Um, then uh, June and July, as I said, depending on kind of the, how much of a long-term economic downturn we see uh, could result in um, – the board making some difficult budget decisions regarding staffing and whether those be in 
furloughs or layoffs or something like that, I would just uh, I'd probably be remiss in my duties if I didn't warn the the board that that decision is potentially coming shortly down the road. So, uh, like I said, right now, uh, property tax collections have been on par with prior years. Uh, we recognize that's been difficult. The treasurer's office has been working with individual taxpayers on payment plans and so forth, but uh, we're not too far behind. But uh, sales taxes is going to be very worrisome. And as, as Peter said, going forward, uh, we know potato contracts are being canceled. Uh, frost hit the fruit orchards pretty bad. Uh, we don't know what the market for uh, produce is going to be. So there is a real potential that uh, – Valuations of properties decrease in the next yep. year or so. So this could be some rough sledding ahead for us. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, <clears throat> we all can see this coming. What's waiting for us down the road? I, I would entertain that we take an inventory of all of our assets as far as the county goes, including the Hapo Center, and look at potentially maybe um, using some of those as capital top side losses so that we can keep our county government uh, in the black. So I, uh, I I think all options are on the table at this point, but yeah, I, that's... I've been approached by the hockey club on wanting to buy the ice rink, so maybe we ought to look at that. I told them that's beyond my jurisdiction. I'm just one commissioner. It would take a, a vote of the of the commissioners, and but this is things we could entertain and look at. It's about... Uh, getting that back on the tax rolls and creating taxes off of it instead of owning it and breaking even at best. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, it might be appropriate to get a little bit of clarification on our earlier discussion with respect to, quote, unquote, opening the county. Uh, just like to be clear, we didn't reopen Franklin County today because we never closed Franklin County. The authority of the governor, as I read in the statute, appears to have expired after 30 days, and it's the state law of Washington that reopened Franklin County. It's just no one put light on it till today. At least that's my view of it. Um, this board doesn't have the authority necessarily to close Franklin County in this circumstance, nor do we have the authority to open it. So I, I, I bring that up just because I want people to focus on the fact that we're we're focusing on the Constitution and the laws of the state of Washington, and we're not out there on a limb saying we're going to do this, we're going to do that. We're, we're simply doing what we were elected and took oaths to do, which is defend the laws of the state of Washington. Now, as I said earlier, if somebody sees somewhere something that says that the governor uh, received written authority from the leader of the Senate and the leader of the House to extend it, uh, please show that to us. I can't find it, and I don't believe it exists, and therefore I believe it expired 30 days into this, and we're now again on day 90. Next thing is with respect to coronavirus, I have absolutely no medical training. I don't mean to make a medical statement here, but it does appear that more people died in Yakima County this month from homicide than from COVID, certainly more than died from COVID in Franklin County. So uh, when we talk about sheltering in place, um, if you've got that many homicides in your county, you might want to shelter in place and not be quite as concerned about COVID-19. Just a personal observation. Uh, that's probably enough. Thanks. And I'd like to elaborate on that. I uh, did some <coughs> looking up the state of Washington. In 2018-2019, the flu deaths in Washington State was 930. The flu deaths so far this year is only 95, 89 adults, 6 children. The COVID deaths were 652 so far this year. That team brings in total to 747 is underneath the 930 of the previous year. Those are just factual numbers from their own site. And you compare it a year to three months or? Well, it's the flu season. It's the flu season of 18 and 19 through the winter, and then the flu season so far, and that was as of uh, April 4th. Okay. And just final note, I meant to note earlier that you know, there's a reference to May 4th. The governor had talked about that date. Uh, as far as I know, nothing that we did today um, has anything to do with any date in May. Uh, board's action is effective immediately, not 
May 4th, not June 30th, not October. Okay. Good point. All right. Anything else? See nothing. We are adjourned. Thank you.